What is going on here? This is Mr. Majewski. This is my Unit 4 test review for Catella A. Push Nation. Uh, we're going to start with a series of Supreme Court cases today. Um, and the first three we're going to talk about are all cases that were decided by the John Marshall Court. Now, we know John Marshall from Marbury v. Madison. We know that he established the principle of judicial review. Seriously pumped up the size and the power of the federal government. Uh, and of the judicial branch as well. Uh, and what he proceeded to do over the next 30 years that he was on the court is he continued uh, to make decisions uh, that continued to expand the power of the federal government in comparison to the states and in comparison to individuals. So, not surprisingly, all three of these first decisions are going to be victories for the federal government um, and defeats for individual state governments who had challenged federal laws. Okay, number one. McCullough v. Maryland. Um, Maryland, a southern state uh, at the time, uh, was um, had a branch of the Bank of the United States located there. This was in the 1810s. Uh, and so what they tried to do was they tried to tax the Bank of the United States branch that was there. Uh, they were trying to essentially tax it uh, to shut it down, all right, or to get it to leave the state. Uh, what the Marshall Court ruled in McCullough, and this is a very famous case, uh, was that the bank was a federal institution and therefore could not be taxed by states. What they said was, essentially, the federal government can tax states, but states can't tax the federal government uh, because the uh, federal government has supremacy. Uh, so it was a victory for the federal government and the Bank of the United States. It was a defeat for individual southern states and specifically states' rights advocates. Secondly, Gibbons v. Ogden. Gibbons v. Ogden is a steamboat case. Uh, long story short, what had happened was um, a state, uh, the state of New York, had given steamboat company uh, exclusive access to all of the streams, all of the roads, uh, I should say all of the streams and rivers uh, that were located in their state. Uh, and, uh, of course, that also sometimes included rivers that were also boundaries with other states that bordered New York. Well... Um, a person sued uh, that, uh, that, that state of New York. A person sued and basically said, hey, it's unfair that one country has control over all of these rivers and they get to control all of the river access and what ships are able to go and to move on those various rivers, uh, especially since some of these rivers technically were the boundaries between New York and other states, which meant multiple states were using them. That's interstate commerce. So what this person said was, hey, uh, states can't regulate interstate commerce, only the federal government can, so New York had no right to establish that rule. The, federal, uh, the Supreme Court under Marshall agreed and said, yep, only the federal government has the right to regulate interstate commerce, uh, states do not, and so therefore uh, New York's state law that had given one company access to all of the streams and rivers uh, was overruled. All right. Again, a victory for the federal government and its right to regulate interstate commerce uh, and a defeat for states who were trying to assert their own state's supremacy or state's rights. Finally, Fletcher v. Peck. Um, there was um, some land that Georgia had claimed in the western portion of its state um, that technically later became part of Alabama and Mississippi. They then... Georgia, sold that land to individual land speculators. Uh, well, um, the public got so outraged when they found out about these land deals uh, that they basically voted the people out who had sold the land and then uh, voted new people in who completely changed that contract or changed that sale. They took that sale away. Uh, what the federal government ruled here is, hey, uh, according to the Constitution's Commerce Clause, all sales are final here, uh, and the state had no right to go back on a contract it had already signed with these people, these land speculators. Uh, and so the state's power to invalidate its own contract uh, was taken away from it by the Supreme Court. Again, what it's basically saying here with Marbury, uh, I'm sorry, with McCullough, when we're talking about the bank, and when we're talking about Gibbons with the steamboats and interstate commerce, and when we're talking about Fletcher v. Peck, uh, and the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, the Marshall Court ruled in all three of those that the federal government's power and rights overruled that of the various states. Commonwealth versus Hunt wasn't a Supreme Court case. All it did was, for the very first time during the market revolution, 
uh, a state, in this case Pennsylvania, ruled that labor unions were allowed to form so long as they did so legally and peacefully. All right, so we're starting to see the development of labor unions uh, where workers are going to unite and team up to try to uh, fight for better rights with their employers. So Commonwealth is the law that officially allowed labor unions to form for peaceful reasons for the very first time in the United States. Charles River Bridge we covered in class. Remember that was where uh, the state of Massachusetts gave exclusive bi bridge building rights uh, to one company. Uh, of course, they then gave a second uh, bridge building right to another company. The first company sued, saying, hey, we should have a monopoly. Uh, the federal government ruled, hey, 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 no. Um, when it comes to um, commerce and it comes to internal improvements, uh, monopolies are bad, competition is good. Uh, and so, therefore, they said the state was entitled to give the second bridge contract to another company because it benefited the consumers, the people. Cherokee versus Georgia, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, and Worcester versus Georgia were both related to Indian removal. Of course, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia basically said uh, that the Cherokee were dependents, uh, which, of course, meant that they, um, they were dependent states. And that, therefore, they were at the mercy of the United States government's order to remove them from their ancestral homelands. Now, remember, Worcester versus Georgia basically said the state of Georgia didn't have the control over Native Americans, exclusive control over Native Americans, in their state boundaries. Those two laws seemed to almost conflict with one another. Um, basically, there was a little bit of uncertainty as to how the court was ruling on this. Uh, the best bet would have been for Jackson to just kind of lay, lay low and to not remove the Indians at that time. Of course, he ignored these decisions and just went ahead with Indian removal anyways. Number two, uh, make sure you know the major candidates and winners in each presidential election between 1824 and 1840. Okay, 1824 is the corrupt bargain election, right? Uh, that is where John Quincy Adams is voted into the presidency by the House of Representatives after there was no electoral winner. Remember, Jackson finished first in the popular and the electoral vote, but nobody had an electoral majority. Uh, and so it went to the House of Representatives. Of course, remember, John Quincy Adams was selected as the president. That, of course, led to the whole thing and claims about corrupt bargains. 1828 and 1832, um, that is uh, the Andrew Jackson elections, right? Andrew Jackson reverses uh, 1824 when he runs in 1828 and is able to defeat Adams. Uh, so uh, that's a rematch, only this time the results are flipped. In 1832, it is Jackson, if you remember, against Clay. The bank was the major issue during that election, just like the tariff had been the major issue in 1828. Um, and ultimately, Jackson was able to beat Clay convincingly. In 1836, it's Jackson's vice president, Martin Van Buren, that's declared the winner, largely because the Whigs, which were a brand new party, um, ran multiple candidates who split the vote. Uh, so therefore, Van Buren was able to beat William Henry Harrison, who finished second. Uh, of course, in 1840, that's the log cabin and hard cider election. Uh, that's where Harrison turns the tables on Van Buren uh, and is able to convince the public that he is more of the common man candidate. Also, Van Buren unpopular because of the Panic of 1837. And so... Harrison becomes the first Whig president, albeit for just a few weeks before he passes away. So again, 1824 is John Quincy Adams. He is a Democratic Republican. 1828 and 1832, you've got Andrew Jackson, uh, who is a founder of this new political party, the Jacksonian Democrats. 1836, it is Van Buren, also a Democrat. Uh, and finally, 1840, we get our first Whig candidate, uh, as president, and that is William Henry Harrison. Um, anyways, uh, you should be aware at least of the presidents in order and who they ran against and really what helps them to uh, achieve uh, victory. All right. Number three, why was the election of 1824 so controversial and how was it eventually decided? Well, I kind of already answered this, but... 
Uh, the election of 1824 was controversial because it was decided by the House of Representatives. Remember, this is the end of the era of good feelings, so there's only one political party, but there are four people who run for president, all representing the same party. Andrew Jackson finished first. John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, finished second. Uh, Henry Clay, remember, finished fourth and dropped out once the hop House decided who the election winner was. Uh, remember, Clay threw his support behind Adams because of his personal feud and rivalry with Jackson. And so ultimately, Adams, despite finishing second in the popular and electoral votes, uh, ended up being declared winner and president of the United States. It was controversial because a few days later, remember, Henry Clay was named Adams' Secretary of State. Supporters of Jackson claimed that a corrupt bargain had been reached by Clay and Adams and that the election had been stolen from Jackson and the people uh, who had wanted Jackson to be their president. Anyways, uh, it led to... Uh, a fracture in the Democratic-Republican Party, uh, and ultimately it set up a massive showdown in 1828 between the two where Jackson got the better of him. Number four, what was the spoil system, also known as political patronage, and what was the intended purpose of those who created it? Okay, so the spoil system was uh, a system that was put into place by Jackson and his vice president, Martin Van Buren, and what it did was it rewarded supporters of Jackson who had helped him to get elected uh, by giving them important posts within the federal government. Uh, the intended purpose was to create loyalty for Jackson and to motivate people to support him during his presidential elections. After all, uh, their jobs depended in a lot of ways on their loyalty and support for Jackson. The biggest negative uh, of the spoil system was that it oftentimes led to bribery and corruption uh, as supporters did whatever they needed to do to get into Jackson's good graces. The other problem was um, government employees, government workers, uh, who may have been the best candidates for certain jobs, uh, oftentimes did not even apply or did not get them because they had not demonstrated that loyalty to Jackson in previous elections. So it makes the government more corrupt and less efficient, a lot of folks believe. Uh, Jackson argued it was good because um, it, it put fresh people into jobs uh, with new ideas um, in order to get things done. All right, number five, uh, explain the circumstances behind the tariff of abominations and the South Carolina exposition and protest. Oh boy, all right, well, beginning in 1860 and then again in 1820 and then again in 1824, the Congress had passed a tariff and they had raised it each year. Uh, and when they did that, of course, Southerners grew increasingly frustrated. We know why. One, Southerners felt that a high tariff just raised prices in the country. Since they weren't producing any industrial goods, they were only buying them. That meant they were going to have to pay higher prices for their goods. Secondly, remember, Southerners were bothered by a high tariff because when we passed tariff against foreign goods coming into our country, they would turn around and pass them against us. Of course, at the time, really the only goods we were exporting that other countries wanted were our crops. So Southerners got double hit. One, they paid higher prices at home. Two, they were hit with harsh ta um, tariffs when they tried to send their goods overseas to other countries. There's a third reason as well, uh, and that, of course, is that um, since the tariffs seemed to definitely benefit the North, um, a lot of Southerners argued uh, that if the South backed down on the issue of tariff, that Northerners would feel united and emboldened to potentially come after other things that the South had that the North might not want or like. I'm talking about slaves. So there is a slavery component to this where part of the opposition to the tariff is also predicated on the fact that the South is worried that it would be uh, the start of them potentially losing slaves down the road as well. So, of course, in 1828, um, the, when John Quincy Adams is president, um, Jackson and his supporters engineered a plan uh, where they passed a tariff in Congress that would massively increase the rate even further. Of course, that is going to make Southerners' heads explode. They already didn't like the rate, uh, and now it's going to be massively increased again. Uh, remember, Jackson did this because he knew Adams was going to have to take a position on the tariff. In one way or the other, uh, he was going to lose supporters. Well, Adams supported the tariff. That meant the South uh, grew increasingly anti-John Quincy Adams, uh, and it helped Jackson to win that election of 1828. 
Uh, the other part of this was, remember, after the tariff was passed, um, South Carolina led the opposition to it. Uh, and they wrote a pamphlet, essentially, that said, that was passed by their legislature, uh, that said the tariff's unfair, uh, it's unconstitutional, and we have the right to nullify it within our boundaries if we would like. Of course, please remember the really interesting part about this. Uh, the South Carolina Exposition was written by the vice president at the time, John uh, Calhoun, uh, of course, he wrote it in secret because he didn't, couldn't let his boss, the president, know that he was actually leading the opposition to the federal government's tariff. Number six, explain the circumstances behind the nullification crisis that existed in 1832 and 1833. What finally resolved the crisis? What was the force bill? Okay, so now Jackson is president, and Henry Clay decides to turn the tables on him, just like Jackson had done to Adams in 1828. So, um, in 1832, a new tariff is passed, uh, and it actually lowered the rate slightly from the tariff of abominations from the 1828 tariff. Uh, but the South thought it should be lowered even further. Uh, and so, South Carolina actually, this time around, went ahead and officially nullified the tariff, and they refused to hand over any tariff money to the federal government, and they refused to collect tariff money in their ports any longer. Um, remember, they also raised an army, anticipating that President Jackson might actually send the military into South Carolina to collect that money. It seemed like a showdown was about to uh, unfold between the federal government under Jackson, who himself was a Southerner, and the southern state of South Carolina. This could lead to a civil war. It would have led most likely to a civil war, because southern states would have most likely sided with South Carolina at this time. What finally resolved the crisis was Henry Clay. Just like he had previously been responsible for the Missouri Compromise, remember, he engineered a compromise tariff of 1833. What that tariff did... Uh, was it lowered the rate every few years, every year, until eventually by 1840, the tariff rate would be back to where it was um, at its lower levels in 1816. Southerners supported it. Uh, Northerners were a little unsure about the compromise. Ultimately, Clay was able to convince enough Northerners that this was the best path for uh, the country in order to keep the country together. Uh, and so ultimately, um, the uh, tariff of compromise tariff was passed, uh, and the nullification crisis was calmed down, and eventually civil war was averted. What was the force bill? The force bill was something passed by Congress after the crisis was over that basically said from now on, the president and the federal government had the right to use the military and use force against any state uh, that did not follow federal laws in regards to the tariff. So it was basically almost a way for the federal government to save face uh, by saying, hey, if you do this again, all right, and you challenge our authority or you try nullification again, we will use the federal government and the military to stop you. Remember, Jackson was bothered by nullification crisis. He thought that South Carolina was making him look bad or trying to make him look weak. Uh, and remember, he condemned it, and more importantly, in private, he had actually threatened to hang the people that were responsible for it. All right. Ultimately, uh, that crisis dies down because of the Compromise Tariff of 1833. Make sure you know the political platforms of each of the following parties from this era, the Democrats and the Whigs. All right, well, let's get into that. So I would encourage you to go to page 14 of the Rise of Mass Democracy notes in order to answer this question. Uh, because it basically gives you their platform. Remember, a political platform is all the things a party wants to fight for at a particular time. Uh, so the platform for the Whigs was, uh, remember, they were supported by northern industrialists and merchants, the wealthiest Americans, because uh, they supported Clay's American system, right? So since they supported an American system, which was generally going to benefit uh, industrialists and merchants who happened to be clustered in the north, they had a lot of support from those people. In addition to that, they wanted to reduce the spoil system. They thought that uh, it led to negatives within the government and that it was only benefiting the Jacksons. Uh, I, sorry, I should say the Jacksonians uh, was making people more loyal to them. Uh, it also included southern states' rights advocates who were angry at Jackson for how he had uh, handled the nullification crisis. So weirdly enough, um, Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, who didn't agree much politically, actually teamed up to form the Whig Party. 
Um, there were uh, nativists uh, that were part of this group as well. Um, they were folks that were opposed to immigration, you need to remember. Um, most immigrants came coming into the country, came into cities on the East Coast. And a lot of those cities, interestingly enough, uh, were dens for the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party seemed to have a lot of support in the South and in large northern cities, uh, largely because the Democratic Party had what are called political machines there, which were using immigrants and granting favors to immigrants in order to get immigrant votes. Uh, the Whigs included evangelicals as well, uh, born-again Christians, folks that were inspired by the Second Great Awakening, um, who uh, were looking to reform society uh, and use the federal government to do that, for instance, to reduce alcohol, to fight for abolition, uh, potentially to fight for women's rights as well. Uh, that's why they supported moral reforms, form reforms that they argued we needed in order to continue to make this country a moral nation and not one that was losing its character uh, as time went on. Uh, and remember, Whigs just generally believe the national government, the federal government, uh, ought to be involved in people's lives uh, in order to solve society's problems. They think that they're better able to use the national government to solve these problems than they would uh, states uh, the national government would have more power, would have more wealth, and would have more ability to resolve these problems as opposed to individual state governments. All right, Democrats uh, were supported by the common people, especially throughout the South. They also had the support, like we just mentioned, of political machines, which were where one party, the Democrats, tended to control all politics in some cities on the East Coast. Uh, and in doing so, oftentimes uh, they convinced immigrants to vote Democrat. Uh, so it included common people throughout this country along with uh, immigrants in many American cities. Uh, they fought for states' rights. They were opposed to the American system, especially the internal improvement portion of it, because they thought that was the state's right to decide whether to do that or not, and that they ought not to have to be told to do so or have to pay money. Uh, for internal improvements that did not benefit them. They favored the spoil systems. After all, they were the ones that came up with it uh, as a way, they said, uh, to improve support for the government. They did not support monopolies. They believed in competition. They thought that there should be small businesses that competed with one another for people's money as opposed to one large company which could set the price and force people to pay whatever it wanted. They also believe the federal government should not be involved in people's personal lives, that it should not be uh, ordering people to not drink, that it should not be taking slaves away, uh, that it was not the federal government's responsibility to do so, uh, that individual states could decide for themselves whether they wanted to restrict alcohol, for instance, or whether they wanted to restrict slavery, and that the federal government ought not to make those decisions. So those were the major basic ideas of both of the political parties. Uh, as we moved into, from the 1820s into the 1830s. Describe the circumstances, number eight, behind the kitchen cabinet controversy. This is kind of minor, but I'll spend a couple of seconds on it here. Uh, Jackson had his regular cabinet, but remember, he used to bring some of his close friends and newspaper editors into the back of the White House, into the kitchen, to unofficially advise him. Some members of Congress were bothered by this because they were worried that the president could get advice from these people, and if a crime were committed, those advisors might not be able to be brought in front of Congress to be investigated. People on the cabinet do have to report to Congress if they are called to do so. Individual citizens uh, might not have to. Uh, so even though the issue was overblown, even though it was kind of not really significant, um, in that he did not really contact them very often, uh, a lot of folks uh, were bothered that the president was using kind of a secondary, unofficial cabinet uh, to advise him um, in the White House. Number nine, why did Jackson and other politicians, and by the way, back to number eight again, if you don't mind, again, another sign uh, that the president basically is going to do things his way and believes that the executive branch ought to be stronger than the other two branches. Uh, he's going to carve out his own path, and even if Congress has a problem with that, right, uh, he just ignores them and continues to seek out these advisors. Uh, number nine, why did Jackson and other politicians before him veto improvement projects like the Maysville Road? Okay, the Maysville Road, remember, 
was an internal improvement that stretched from the East Coast all the way out West. Um, he vetoed them for the same reason that Jefferson and Madison and Monroe had vetoed them as well. Southern presidents tended to support states' rights, uh, and they did not believe that Southern states should be forced to pay for projects, for programs that would not directly benefit them. Their attitude was, if you're going to build roads, uh, roads are going to directly benefit the, the states where the roads are built through, so therefore the states ought to be the ones building those roads. There is a secondary argument that, remember, Jackson vetoed it because the Maysville Road was about to be going, was about to go through Kentucky, uh, and that Jackson had a long, simmering feud with Henry Clay and vetoed it solely so that Kentucky could not benefit from the road project. Uh, number 10, why did President Jackson oppose the Bank of the United States? Well, this goes back as well decades. Remember, Southerners, and specifically Jackson, uh, had argued that the Bank of the United States was a bad thing, that it uh, was a den of wealth uh, that was run by incredibly wealthy East Coast bankers, um, that they gave out loans primarily to merchants and industrialists in the North, and that they would not give loans out, generally speaking, uh, to farmers in the South uh, in the same amounts. Uh, and so there was a belief that the bank... One was unconstitutional by some Southerners, even though the McCullough decision said it wasn't, uh, and that it was only benefiting the North and especially the wealthiest classes in this country. Um, who ran the bank? Remember, the bank president was a wealthy guy named Nicholas Biddle. Uh, Biddle and Jackson got into a significant feud with one another, a very public feud, which only motivated Jackson to want to get rid of the bank earlier. So we remember how Jackson vetoed the rechartering of the bank in 1836, and then he made the decision to go ahead and to kill the bank early with his pet bank scheme, where he deposited the federal government's money out, withdrew the federal government's money out of the bank, and redeposited into 23 pet banks, which were state banks from states that were loyal to Jackson. Uh, so ultimately, not only did he veto the rechartering of the bank. Uh, he then killed the bank early with his pet bank scheme. Of course, we know uh, the major impact or effect of that was it helped contribute to the Panic of 1837 in this country. Let's go to number 11, Speak of the Devil. What were the major causes and impacts of the panic? Well, we've got a few. The first major cause of the panic, like I just mentioned, was Jackson's killing of the bank. The second major impact or cause of the uh, panic was overspeculation um, by what are called wildcat banks. Uh, many of these wildcat banks, including some of the pet banks, we call them wildcat because they were especially risky with all of this money that had just been deposited into uh, their vaults. Uh, and so many of them gave out bad loans. All right, They uh, gave out loans uh, to folks that were questionable, especially folks that were building internal improvement projects out west. Many of these projects ended up being failures. Uh, these people struggled to pay the money back, which resulted in hundreds of banks closing, uh, including some of Jackson's pet banks. Uh, other causes of the panic of 1837, besides overspeculation and Jackson's killing of the bank, uh, was a decrease in uh, crop prices. All right, remember we were starting to overproduce some crops, and that resulted in crop price decreases, which of course uh, hurt people out west, especially farmers, uh, who really struggled to pay money back to banks, which only led the problem to get worse. Impacts. Um, many lost their businesses and farms. All right, uh, Unemployment skyrocketed um, and uh, production dropped significantly. We stopped producing goods uh, we didn't bring in as much money um, in tariff money uh, because Americans were not purchasing as many goods from overseas suppliers either. Uh, and so it was a snowball effect. Uh, in addition to that, politically, the major impact was Martin Van Buren. The president at the time became quite unpopular for, his, for the belief that he was not responding to the panic aggressively enough. Remember, the Whigs in Congress wanted the federal government to borrow a bunch of money so they could create programs to, to make jobs. They wanted the public to make it seem like the government was doing something to help, uh, but Van Buren vetoed those decisions, and when he did so, uh, the public kind of turned on him. 
and that opened the door politically for the Whigs and William Henry Harrison in 1840. Number 12, what was the Specie Circular and the Divorce Bill, and why did uh, the Specie Circular and the Divorce Bill, and why did Jackson and Man Van Buren issue both policies? What effects did they have on the U.S. economy? Okay, Specie Circular, uh, we were low on gold during the Panic of 1837, especially after the fall of the Bank of the United States, uh, and so um, we, uh, the government passed a law, Congress passed a law with Jackson's support, that said, Western farmers that wanted to buy land out west needed to pay for it in gold or silver. Well, in gold. Um, of course, what that meant was since most farmers were poor or middle class at most, they didn't really have gold available. They stopped buying land. And so Western land sales absolutely plummeted, which was another drain on the economy during the Panic of 1837. While the panic was going on, uh, at the end of his term as president, President Van Buren um, passed something that became known as the Independent Treasury Bill, but was nicknamed the Divorce Bill. And what it did was it removed all money from all banks, all federal government money from all banks, uh, because we had lost some of it during the panic, uh, and Van Buren did not want to see the federal government lose any more of its funds. Uh, and we took that money out of those pet banks, and we deposited them into treasury vaults. Now, that kept the money safe, but it really prevented um, the banks from having access to that money where they could have potentially given it out uh, to some Americans, which might have helped to slow down the panic uh, or even uh, helped us to recover from the panic faster uh, once the worst effects of it were over. Uh, regardless, uh, both of these guys did this because of severe economic strain on the country at the time. Um, neither of them really helped to solve the problems. In fact, in many ways, they both made the problems associated with the panic worse. Uh, again, um, which doesn't help Van Buren as he's running for re-election in 1840. Uh, 13. Describe Jackson's Indian removal policy inside the United States. Why did he feel Indian removal was necessary? Okay, well, uh, Jackson's Indian removal policy inside the United States was quite simple. There were five civilized tribes that were still east of the Mississippi River. We called them civilized because they had um, better acc acclimated themselves to white society. For instance, they adopted white languages in some instances. They wore... Uh, American clothing, American style clothing. They um, developed American style alphabets. They uh, were largely farmers, like most Americans were, um, and uh, and they even had their own American constitutions in some regards. Uh, and so they were more acclimated uh, or blended into American society than most other tribes, and that had allowed them to stay in their ancestral homelands longer than most of the others who were already gone. So what Jackson's Indian removal did uh, was it ordered those five tribes to the Oklahoma Territory, which was also known as the Indian Territory, where they would be permanently resettled, uh, and that land would permanently then belong to them. He believed it was necessary for a few reasons. One, many American whites wanted to move into these areas, particularly after gold was discovered on some of these ancestral lands. Two, um, he largely um, was hostile to natives, or at least throughout much of his life he had been. Uh, and so he was um, kind of somebody that didn't treat natives with as much respect. In fact, in a lot of ways, uh, it is possible uh, that uh, he uh, just wanted him out of the way entirely um, and so that they would no longer harass or bother Americans uh, in those areas. What uh, what were the impacts of Indian removal on the five civilized tribes? Loss of culture, loss of ancestral homelands, right? In some instances, like with the Seminole Indians, conflict breaks out as they resisted resettlement. Um, they are, uh, thousands of people are lost along the way, as many of these tribes experience a trail of terrors, as they are forced to walk thousands of miles to their new homeland by the U.S. military, uh, a lot of bad blood, a lot of harsh feelings between these natives and the U.S. government. And, of course, they get to Oklahoma, uh, and that land that had been promised to them, portions of it are later taken away and given to other native tribes that arrive afterwards. Uh, Fifteen, what caused Americans to declare their independence from Texas in 1836, and why did Jackson not annex them? Okay, well, 
Uh, Americans, remember, had been invited into Texas by the Mexican government uh, as early as the 1820s, so long as they followed all Mexican laws and refused to bring slaves in. Americans increasingly brought more slaves in in violation of that agreement, uh, and uh, the Mexican government, under their new gen uh, leader, General Santa Ana, restricted American immigration because they felt like too many Americans were showing up and overwhelming the Mexicans that were living in Texas at the time. Of course, the famous war broke out between Texas and Mexico. Texas wins its independence. Jackson did not annex Texas at the time because he did not want uh, to cause the whole issue over um, representation, free versus slave states, to reignite again in this country. Uh, describe demographic or population changes that occurred inside the United States in the 19th century. Okay, well, our population skyrocketed again, just like it had really since the 1600s. It continues to massively increase. Um, we start to see more people moving to American cities, although still overwhelmingly the population was rural. It was agricultural. Uh, we really start to see the growth of cities, particularly as some cities grow very, very large here by the end of the 1800s. Uh, and we start to see the arrival of new immigrant groups into this country as well. It starts with the Irish, who, I mean, prior to this, it was almost all just English immigration. But um, as we get into the 1800s, we see waves of Irish immigrants in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, many of them pushed over by the potato famine and many of them seeking out new jobs uh, and a better quality of life inside the industrializing United States. We that they were then followed by German immigrants, if you remember, largely from, uh, or largely that headed to the Midwest, whereas the Irish settled in cities in the North to take factory jobs. Uh, Germans tended to cluster together in small farming communities across the North. Uh, so not only did our population increase. Uh, but so, so did uh, the growth of cities, so did um, our, our ethnicity, right? Because we're starting to receive, instead of just almost exclusively English folks and African slaves, now we're starting to see more and more waves of Irish and German immigrants. And of course, many of them are Catholic, uh, which of course uh, is going to influence uh, the growth of Catholicism in this country, and it's going to lead to the rise of nativism in response to Catholics coming in. Number 17, what was meant by the term of cult of domesticity, and what impacts did it have on gender equality? Okay, so in this era, um, the idea of Republican motherhood that had existed before was kind of changed, and the role of women in society uh, was altered. A woman's role in the family, according to uh, popular opinion during this time, was to be a homemaker, to be somebody that stayed at home as a housewife. And her job was to create a, a place of purity and a place of comfort and peace for the rest of the family uh, so that when the husband came home every day from working hard, her job was to really cater to his every need. Uh, and to make sure that she ran a perfect home, uh, that she catered to all of her husband and children's need. Uh, and by the way, I mean, there was pressure to not only keep up the home, but to keep up themselves. Um, and uh, there was almost like there were two separate spheres in society. There was the outside sphere that was the man's world, and then there was the inside sphere, the home, which was supposed to be the domain of the woman, and it was her responsibility to create this place of purity and peace for the entire rest of the family. What impacts did this notion of the cult of domesticity have? Well, uh, it led to ideas that women ought to uh, be in the home, that uh, they should not be working outside of the home, that they ought to be getting married, uh, and that they ought to be having more children. Now, women who rejected the cult of domesticity oftentimes were the ones who went out in society and began to operate as reformers. Uh, but the popular opinion was that a woman's role was in the home. Uh, and uh, for the very first time during this era, we start to see like women's magazines like Cosmopolitan and some of these others. Uh, the most famous was called the Godey's Lady Book, uh, which was designed to kind of help women to create uh, this home situation uh, that was supposed to be ideal. All right, number 18. What was the Second Great Awakening, and what effects did it have on 
Uh, American religion and society. All right, well, the Second Great Awakening was a spiritual reemergence that occurred in the 1830s, 20s and 30s, almost 100 years after the original Great Awakening. Uh, what impacts did it have on American religion and society? Well, it led to the development of new religions uh, and the growth of many religions in this country, especially Protestant ones. So that by the end of nineteen, by the end of the eighteen hundreds, uh, many of these Protestant faiths are some of the largest in the entire country. In addition to that, its greatest impact uh, is that it led to a period of reforms in this country. Uh, as a result of the inspirational messages of the Second Great Awakening, many women, especially educated women, went out into the cities or went out into society and tried to fix a wrong that they had identified. The most common, again, abolition, uh, women's rights, better treatment uh, and equality for women, uh, temperance, which, remember, uh, is where you decrease the amount of alcohol you consume, um, you know, prison and mental health reform uh, were possible issues uh, that a person could be motivated to go out and try to resolve as well. Education, right, was another one, free public education. So that's the greatest impact, these reform movements. And it also, again, of course, um, allows for the reemergence and the growth of many religions as well. I should also mention that a number of churches split during this time uh, as a result of the Second Great Awakening into northern and southern branches. So, for instance, there was a northern Baptist church and a southern Baptist church. I'm sure you can probably figure out why they split. The issue was over slavery. A lot of the northern branches of the church wanted of these churches wanted slavery abolished, whereas many of the southern ones argued uh, it should be preserved. Uh, and so in some cases, some of these churches literally split into two different ones uh, over this issue of slavery. Number 19, who were the religious figures? Who was the religious figure credited with starting the Second Great Awakening? Which circuit rider was the most influential? Remember, during the Second Great Awakening, we would have what were called these camp meetings, uh, where these guys would travel around and give these outdoor speeches and messages to the public. Uh, and it was almost like a camp experience uh, where you would come out for multiple days uh, and potentially watch the festivities, watch the speeches, and be inspired. Uh, the person who really started this, and it was called Riding the Circuit, by the way, these men, these ministers who performed it, uh, would go from city to city, place to place, um, and they would, uh, quote-unquote, ride the circuit. Now, the man who started this was a guy named Peter Cartwright. Uh, he's kind of the man that gets the Second Great Awakening kick-started. Uh, and then, of course, the man who is seen as really the father of the Second Great Awakening and the man that's responsible for spreading its ideas the most and converting the most people uh, was George Grandison, uh, Charles Grandison Finney, um, who uh, is usually the name that we associate the most with it. I should also mention one other thing that occurred out of the Second Great Awakening uh, was the emergence of new American religions, uh, many of them based on utopian, perfect society ideals. Uh, the most famous, of course, are the Mormon Church, the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, which was formed directly out of the Second Great Awakening. It was a new faith that emerged. Remember, uh, one area of western New York was called the Burned Over District because there was so much Second Great Awakening activity there uh, that it felt like there were fiery speeches and camp meetings going on every seemingly every day. Uh, and, of course, that area, the Burned Over District, western New York, was where Mormonism developed for the first time. Number 20, describe the major reform movements that were inspired by the Second Great Awakening. Be sure to include the individuals considered responsible for starting or leading that movement. We're going to start with the temperance movement. Of course, the temperance movement tried to encourage folks to consume less alcohol or to get rid of it entirely. Um, the uh, major uh, organization was the American Temperance Society, obviously. It was largely dominated by women. Uh, women tended to dominate this, uh, this group, men not so much, um, and particularly Protestant women. Um, immigrants, and particularly Catholics, did not usually support temperance. Uh, because alcohol, beer and alcohol, was considered more a part of their cultural traditions, especially those that had come from Europe. Uh, Protestants, many of them very moral, wanting a more evangelical, strict interpretation of the Bible in this country, believed temperance uh, was needed because we were becoming an alcoholic society. Uh, they had their greatest success in states. They never were able to pass a national law. 
at least not at this time. Uh, they had their greatest success in states. Uh, the most famous was probably uh, the Dow laws that were passed in Maine, which actually abolished uh, alcohol, which actually banned it, prohibited it. Uh, but the reality was by 1850s and 60s, 60s, as more immigrants from Europe, especially Irish and Germans, came into the country, um, they were these laws, these temperance laws, were oftentimes outvoted or overruled uh, by folks that simply didn't want them anymore. Education reform, of course, the name you need to associate with that is Horace Mann. Uh, Horace Mann uh, believed that education ought to be free and that it ought to be public and provided to all children and all families free of charge at taxpayer expense. They thought he thought you didn't you shouldn't have to pay for uh, for schooling. Uh, that it should be provided for free and it should come out of taxpayer dollars. He also massively expanded. Uh, the number of, uh, he fought to massively expand the number of schools. Uh, he tried to increase uh, teacher training, especially for young Protestant women, uh, unmarried women, because if you're married, you're supposed to go back into the home, thanks to that darn cult of domesticity. Uh, but unmarried women, uh, um, a, uh, you know, there were some teacher training programs, things along those lines. Prison and mental health reform, it comes down to Dorothea Dick. She really makes this a one woman show. Uh, in trying to fight for prison rehabilitation and mental health reform. Up until this point, for the most part, uh, prison and mental health reform was a disaster. It was usually all about punishment and detention and not so much about rehabilitation. Uh, Dix travels around and chronicles the uh, prisons and mental health asylums in this country, and as a result, her writings resonated with enough people to where there were demands uh, that reforms take place and prisons began to focus more on rehabilitation and mental health asylums uh, began to actually treat people for their diseases instead of just simply locking them up. Women's rights goes big during this era after the Second Great Awakening. Uh, they really kickstart their movement with the Seneca Falls Convention, which was a meeting of men and women who were devoted to the issue of women's rights. It was organized, if you remember, uh, by, um, I'm drawing a blank, it was organized by Susan B. Anthony, all right, um, it was organized by, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. So those were the three early trailblazers for women's rights. Um, again, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, and Lucretia Mott. Really focus on um, Stanton and Susan B. Anthony because they were the two most important. These three ladies basically got the women's rights or, uh, moving uh, when they organized that Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, while they were there, uh, they issued something called the Seneca Falls Declaration, uh, which basically rewrote the Declaration of Independence. But in doing so, it pointed out the lack of equality that women had in this country. Uh, again, even though the women's rights movement was condemned by many people, including many newspapers, uh, this is where they begin to fight for equality. Now, they weren't fighting for voting rights at this time. They were fighting, fighting for things like uh, property rights, that women should ought to be able to hold on to their property. Um, they were fighting to make it easier, for instance, for women to get divorces and get out of bad relationships, especially abusive ones. Uh, they were fighting uh, for women to have the same legal equality, uh, not necessarily voting rights. Um, but they simply wanted women to begin to be treated more equally, and they started out smaller instead of demanding everything at once. Uh, describe each of the, what was the most important reform movement that appeared following the Second Great Awakening? Without a doubt, it was abolition, the abolition of slavery. Um, but it is so important, to be quite honest with you, that we save it for our next slavery notes, uh, where we will go into incredible detail about them. 22, describe each of the utopian societies that formed during the 19th century. Okay, so during these early to mid-1800s, as people became inspired by the Second Great Awakening uh, and by philosophical movements like transcendentalism, some groups decided to go out into nature and to almost kind of create their own society, create their own what they thought perfect, they called them utopian societies, 
Now, to do this, they would go out into the wilderness and they would essentially try to build their own community that was completely removed or separated from the rest of American society. Their attitude was that American, the United States at that point was already too corrupt and too greedy uh, to be able to be saved. And so they were going to go out and kind of live in isolation uh, based on their own personal ideas of uh, what was the best way to live. Um, some examples of Brook Farm. Brook Farm was founded by transcendentalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, the idea was that everything would be shared, almost like a commune, like a communist sort of relationship where nobody actually owned property, everybody shared it together, and everybody split or shared in the profits equally. Um, the whole problem with Brook Farm, um, this transcendentalist hotbed, this area where pretty much almost every transcendentalist philosopher stayed for a time, uh, was that they didn't have a lot of money. They never really made a lot of money. And one of their barns that they had built and spent a lot of mon money on uh, had a burned down. They were unable to pay that off. So ultimately, um, Brook Farm was not very successful. It did not last very long. The Oneida community uh, did last longer. This lasted about 50 years. Um, these people were weird. They completely challenged sexual norms at the time. Um, the Oneida community, first off, was able to be successful for so long because they, they produced really beautiful and highly sought-after silver products like silverware. Um, uh, the problem with the Oneida community in the eyes of most people was their sexual practices. Remember, they believe in free love. Uh, they would arrange marriages where they would have pe pair people up uh, in order to produce what they would consider to be superior young people. Um, they did not believe in, like, monogamous relationships. Uh, people kind of were free to experiment with each other, even if you were not married to one another. Um, if you remember, that's, they um, were pretty extreme, all right, especially for that time, but even all the way up till today. Um, so they completely ignored gender roles uh, and basically argued uh, that free love um, and uh, free choice were the most important things. Uh, the Shakers uh, were a third utopian society founded by a woman named Mother Anne Lee. Um, and uh, if you remember, these folks were also kind of weird when it came to sexual behavior, but in a very different way. The Shakers were celibate, remember? They did not believe there were any differences between men and women. Um, and uh, in fact, men and women kind of wore the same clothing in their society, um, they were known as shakers because they were very religious, very Protestant, and they were known to shake or quake uh, when they were practicing their faith. Uh, ultimately, they lasted um, all, all the way into the 1900s, largely because, remember, uh, they weren't having children because they weren't having sex because they were celibate, so they would recruit in orphanages. They would bring orphans back, uh, and those folks would be the next generations of their converts that would stay in their community. 23, be sure you can identify the individuals responsible for bringing the textile factory system to New York. Well, we know uh, there are two people that are primarily responsible for this. The first is Samuel Slater, right? He's the father of the, fa of the American factory system. What he did is he sold the blueprints from the factory that he worked in in England. He brought them over to the United States, and then he basically recreated the thing step by step, piece by piece. The other major textile uh, innovator uh, was Francis Cabot Lowell. Francis Cabot Lowell was the first person to build an all-in-one inclusive textile factory um, in the United States. Both of these people were located in New England. That became the center of the textile industry, and really it was just the center of industry in general in this country. Uh, so um, Slater kind of starts the process by bringing over the blueprints and building the first factory, and then Lowell is responsible for building the first fully self-contained factory where all parts of production, from beginning to middle to end, would be done under one roof. Number 24, be sure you can identify the significance and inventor for each of the following. The cotton gin was developed by Eli Whitney. Of course, he was a northerner who happened to be traveling in the south, uh, what it did was it separated the really painful seed from the remainder of the cotton plant. That used to be the long, slow part of the process. Now, because you could separate the seed from the plant much faster, southern plantation owners began to import millions more slaves because now, almost as quickly as the cotton could be picked, it could be cleaned through the cotton gin and then put into a bale.
Uh, interchangeable parts. So in a lot of ways, the cotton gin being born helps to revive slavery at a time when a lot of folks thought it was dying out. Uh, they, it revived slavery uh, and it really ignites the slavery debate again. Interchangeable parts, also invented by Eli Whitney, interchangeable parts are pretty straightforward. When a machine was operating, if it broke down, oftentimes expensive parts had to be ordered and long delays could occur as you waited for repairmen and parts to arrive from who knows where. Uh, but with the development of cheap interchangeable parts, like simple ball bearings, you know, the metal balls and things like that, um, you could simply pop out the broken piece, replace it with a brand new cheap one that you had already on supply in your factory. And what that meant was uh, inefficiency was reduced, right? We're able to produce more throughout the country because when machines malfunctioned, the, the process of fixing them did not require a lot of special skill. It did not require a lot of extra cost. Uh, and you could then fix that machine as quickly as possible and get it back and producing right away. Steel plow uh, was invented by a person named John Deere, and this was used exclusively out west in the Midwestern states. Uh, the soil out there was a little heavy. It was a little hard, especially the topsoil on the very obviously top of the ground. And traditional plows did not dig deep enough uh, to get to the fertile soil underneath. And so he developed a steel plow, a plow that was produced largely out of steel, uh, that a um, pack animal could pull, uh, and when it was pulled, it was heavy enough to dig down deep enough so that that fertile soil underneath the topsoil could be reached. It was a major innovation that completely opened up the Midwest uh, to massive amounts of food production and grain production. It also helped the Southwest uh, grow more cotton as well. Speaking of helping farmers to grow crops, the mechanical reaper was an incredible invention uh, that did the work of five men on a farm. Uh, it was operated usually by horse, and what it would do uh, is it would reap your crops, which essentially means cut them down when they're ready to be harvested. It would also bind the crops into bales on its own. Uh, there was also a mower that was connected to it as well. Uh, it had other purposes, uh, but those were generally the three most important. Uh, ultimately, farm work becomes done much faster when you use the reaper. You're able to produce a lot more, which means in theory you ought to be able to sell a lot more. Uh, some of the biggest problems with the reaper was that it was kind of expensive, and so a lot of farmers had to borrow money in order to buy one. Um, and, of course, that could lead to debt, especially during times of panic, uh, that could result in them not being able to pay it back and potentially lose everything. The steamboat was invented by Robert Fulton, and of course the steamboat um, was uh, a steam engine that was placed onto a boat, uh, and what it did immediately was it allowed boats to be able to transport uh, in both directions on waterways. Prior to that, you usually were at the mercy of the current, uh, and so the transport of people and goods by river was massively increased. Uh, of course, uh, the steamboat was just vital, again. Not just to moving people, not just moving goods, but also things like information, right, could be transported much quicker than they would have been previously. Of course, because of the steamboat craze in this country, it, got, it leads to a canal building craze so that more and more places can be reached via steamboat. Uh, the telegraph is another important invention during this time. This wasn't about production. This was about communication. Telegraph is where you have a wire that is laid out uh, either above ground or underneath ground, and you have operators who operate telegraph machines that are little metal machines that are connected to the wire. They can send basically coded messages to one another in a series of beeps and buzzes uh, that the other person on the other side was able to hear and then translate into English. It's basically an early primitive version of a telephone uh, only um, the operator of the telegraph was the only one that could receive messages, and then they would write them down and then deliver them to people in town who had received, who were supposed to have received the message. Massively increases information and communication. It, it absolutely links the regions of the country together better than they had been before. Uh, it also technically allows for more buying and selling of goods, which is also a boost to the economy as well, because you didn't have to conduct all transactions face-to-face. -face. Uh, you could do those from long ranges, long distances through the telegraph. Number 25, for what purposes were the Erie Canal and the National Road created? Well, remember, they're created primarily uh, 
uh, to link the country together, to link north to south, north to west, and even um, south to west as well. Um, largely, it was because the East Coast needed natural resources. It needed cotton and other goods in order to produce textiles, in order to produce clothing. It needed farm products out west in order to uh, feed its growing populations. And the only way we had to be able to transport all of these resources to the East Coast was to be able to build things like canals and roads. And so the Erie Canal was built to connect New York City to the, mid to the Great Lakes, um, and uh, it was a massive success. It led to copycat canals being built all over this country. The National Road, remember, was started in the early 1800s, uh, and it was designed to run all the way from Maryland on the East Coast to Illinois out West. Again, link the country together and get those resources from the West over to the East Coast where they can be turned into finished industrialized products. 26. Make sure you can describe the transportation and industrial revolutions and how each contributed to the development of a market economy. Well, industrial revolution, of course, starts in textiles, quickly spreads to other areas. Uh, remember, in order for textile industry to benefit or to profit, they need access to cotton so they can spin that cotton into finished clothing. Uh, where did they get the cotton? They got it from the South. So therefore, the South and the North were absolutely leaked, linked economically through the textile industry, and what was good for one was usually good for the other when it came to making money. That also meant that both the North and the South were economically dependent on one another. Um, the South needed the North to be able to sell their cotton to. The North needed that cotton in order to turn it into clothing. Uh, and so they become more dependent on one another economically even while, quite frankly, they were growing further apart sectionally and politically. Uh, the, the transportation revolution, remember, it started with roads and turnpikes, then it went to canals, finally it went to railroads. All of these better connect the country, almost all of the roads, uh, almost all of the railroads, most of the canals are in fact located uh, in the north, and so they definitely benefited from these projects more than the south did but not exclusively. Um, in addition uh, to the transportation and industrial revolutions, remember uh, what the West was doing is producing the food that was essentially feeding the other two regions. So the South is growing the cotton and other crops that are then being used as cash crops to support industry like textiles in the North. And meanwhile, what was the West doing? They were focusing on food production like grain, uh, which could then be used to support those massively increasing populations in this country. 27, in what order did the internal improvement crazes inside the U.S. occur? Again, I kind of already answered this, but uh, the first major internal improvement craze, craze was roads and turnpikes. Um, and probably the best example of that is, is the very first turnpike in this country. It was called the Lancaster Turnpike. Um, it was only about 60 to 70 miles long. Uh, that was followed up by the National Road, which was thousands of miles long, but took almost 50 years to build. After roads and turnpike craze came the canal building craze because of the recent invention of the steamboat um, and the success of the Erie Canal. After the canal building craze died down, railroads became the hot internal improvement to build. Uh, of course, railroads were not nearly as reliable, as safe, or as efficient as they were at this time, as they are going to be after the Civil War ends. Finally, 28, who were the Lowell girls and what became of them in this era? Lowell girls were farm girls. They were local farm girls, local Protestant farm girls, usually unmarried. Uh, and uh, they were working in the factory for Francis Cabot Lowell and other factory owners in the 1810s and early 1820s. It was an excellent opportunity, one of the few opportunities for women uh, in this country to work outside of the home. Lowell preferred to hire unmarried girls. Uh, once they were married, oftentimes, again, uh, their role in society was to be a mother and a housewife of a perfect, uh, perfectly kept home. Uh, so what became of them in this era? Well, by the 1830s, especially the late 1830s, uh, the Lowell girls started to re be replaced by cheaper, low-wage immigrant labor from Ireland and Germany. Uh, and, of course, that's going to lead to nativism and anti-immigrant beliefs in this country. 
um, by uh, the American Party, by the Know Nothing Party, and by nativist groups who were resistant and resentful to the waves of immigrants coming in during this era. All right, folks, I do hope this helps you out as you go through some of the main topics in this era. Uh, Let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to assist. It's Mr. M signing out. I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope you have an amazing remainder to your work.